Well, welcome to this OpenShift Commons briefing today. Um, we're really pleased to have Hazelcast's Chris Engelbert with us to talk about in-memory distributed computing um, using Hazelcast. And we're coming streaming live from a couple of hotel rooms. So we're just going to just say up front, there may be a few breaks in the Wi-Fi um, where he is in Spain and where I am in Texas. So today is going to be interesting. Uh, we're going to have the session um, live streaming now with on Blue Jeans. It will also be available to be um, watched afterwards on YouTube. If you have questions, there's a chat um, box here. I just ask that you type them in there. And we're going to let Chris introduce himself and his topic. And if you have questions, I think there'll be one little pause that he takes when he tries to upload on Wi-Fi um, a Docker image to Docker Hub or something like that. Um, but we're going to let Chris start. And it should be about 20, 30 minutes of talking and demoing. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And I'll open up the mics then. So Chris, take it away and introduce yourself. OK. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Um, so you already said we're talking about MRE uh, distributed computing on OpenShift today. Um, the the most important part, it's, it will I will try to show how to run Hazelcast on OpenShift. Uh, the in-memory distri uh, distributed computing part will be a bit less on that. Um, but if you're really interested into that part, just Google for my name. There are quite a few uh, different recordings from different conferences or webinars and stuff. And those are all about in-memory distributed computing uh, at all and about how to do that on Hazelcast. So today will be mostly Hazelcast and OpenShift. So um, normally that is my first game. Um, I can't ask people if everybody read that, but I think you did, and you probably know what is in there. So it basically says, don't believe me. Um, so who I am, um, uh, Diane already said it, I'm Chris Engelbert, um, coming from Germany, being raised in one of the biggest industry areas in Germany. Um, currently, I'm working as manager of developer relations at Hazelcast. Um, I actually joined in November 2013 as one of the core developers, um, moved on to the cool stuff, doing conferences, traveling the world, like all the good stuff you can do over, over the world. Um, for people that love to use Twitter, uh, you see my Twitter handle down in the slides. I know you're not supposed to have your Twitter handle on every slide, but I don't care. Um, if you really want to have your Twitter timeline bursted, just follow me and you're good to go. Um, I would say I'm a Twitter, uh, I'm, I'm a Java passionist. Uh, that means I'm part of the uh, Java JCP, the Java community process that actually moves the Java um, language and the JVM forward. Um, and just today we got the proposal for Java 9, so that will be fun looking through that. But apart from that, um, I'm really interested in, in seeing that Java is one of where I'm, I'm really interested to see that Java is, is one of the most um, used and, and most um, interesting language. And it's still growing, and that is good. Apart from that, well, everything about performance, garbage collection, all those kind of benchmark fairy tales. I mean, we all know benchmarks are not real. Um, everything um, in, in, in those kinds of things uh, is exactly what I normally do. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I already kind of gave the introduction. We're talking about in-memory computing. In-memory uh, means fast and, and, and fast storage. But we do this with Hazelcast, uh, with OpenShift. And I think that most of the viewers from the OpenShift blog or the OpenShift briefings probably know how OpenShift really works. It actually works on Kubernetes and Docker. So far, so good. So Docker, as I said, you probably all know that. Docker is meant to, to just build an image. You ship it somewhere, you run it, and it, it just magically works. It pretty much works wherever you are. Docker hides all that kind of weird shit that you normally have to do in deployment, and it just magically works for you, auto magic. Uh, Kubernetes on the other side, I stole this from, from um, Ray Tsang, one of the um, evangelists from from Google, and I really love, love that picture, Kubernetes actually manages the cluster for you. Uh, it, you tell um, Kubernetes, I want to have 20, uh, 20 machines of that image, and Kubernetes 
again, automatically make sure that this all happens somehow, somewhere. And I think that's pretty cool. He actually showed it with his Hello World. That's why this picture has a Hello World. He just started Hello World, I think, 100 times in, in the Google Cloud. Pretty cool. Um, OpenShift now takes Docker and Kubernetes and some, some internal parts and, and just moves all that together. And that is the interesting thing, because OpenShift itself gives you this amazing infrastructure that automatic hand, well, automatically handles all the different parts of deployment strategies, of how to distribute your, your images, and um, how to scale up and scale down. And at Hazelcast, we thought that is cool, and we definitely need to be part of that. So the interesting thing is, what is Hazelcast? And I think that is where most of the people probably don't know yet. So in, uh, Hazelcast is a so-called in-memory data grid. And I really love the picture because we're not going to have a laser, uh, but it's pretty close. So in-memory data grid means we're storing, for, first and foremost, it means we're storing data in memory. I think you got that part. Um, the other part is data grid. That means you can store data, you can compute data. It's not just caching or those simple solutions, but you can really do a lot of things. A lot of people think an in-memory data grid might be something like an in-memory database. It's kind of close. Just remove the persistency part and you're pretty close to what it is. So as I said, or as I already said, there's one important thing. When you have a cluster running and you store data, um, there are two different ways. So let's, let's take the other one first. The first one is data replication. I certainly forgot a slide for that. Data replication. That means you, you save the same data on all machines. That is nice because you can just route your read requests to every node. Uh, and that will give you a speed up, but it means you, you have the same data. And that means you're wasting a lot of memory. So the other option is data distribution, and that is what Hazelcast does. That means if we have this grill and this big pyramid of nuts in the middle, um, what we actually do, we take subsets of those nuts and distribute it in the cluster. That is cool for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have like a huge shared Java heap because you, you're, um, you're almost linearly scale up the, the heap in the different JVMs. Uh, the other reason is if we have a request, um, a query or whatever you want to send to the data, we actually send it to all the nodes and everybody's working on this little data set in parallel. And that is the cool part because that means it speeds up your queries massively. So let's get further. As I said, it speeds up data and speeding up data actually means we want or where you, you start to use caching and in-memory data grids and stuff is when you want to have fast delivery. Cachings, uh, caches are the most typical solution or the most typical use case, uh, but not the only one. Uh, we actually have customers using Hazelcast as their primary, first and foremost, primary data store. You, they still plug some database uh, behind that to make sure that if, the if they have to restart the cluster for some reason, that they can restart and re read the data. But they use Hazelcast for pretty much everything, and their application only knows about Hazelcast. And Hazelcast knows about how to write to this underlying database stuff. So why do we go for in-memory when we want to have fast, fast delivery? So I, I have this nice. Uh, or I have this nice numbers here, and I think everybody knows that L1, L2, uh, these days even L3 and L4 caches are the fastest memory you can get. But unfortunately, those things are still pretty small. Even though you have one of the Xenon CPUs, uh, it's still just like 64 or max or, or anything like that. I'm not sure what the current value is. The, the interesting thing is main memory. So we're at 100 nanoseconds access time for main memory, and that is pretty fast. It actually is faster than uh, than a gigabit. Sorry. So it actually faster is faster than the gigabit network. Um, still, a gigabit network is amazingly fast if you look at other things like a spinning disk, which is 10 times as slow. 
uh, sorry, uh, 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 a thousand times as slow, um, or even sending a, a, a network packet, a TCP tech package from California and, uh, to Amsterdam and back to California. That is 150 millisecond latency. You really don't want those things in your cluster. True. Um, even, even if we look at network compared to spinning disk, so there is one uh, 0 0.01 millisecond access time over a gigabit network, but there's 0 0.15 milliseconds, so 15 times as slow as the network. That means our gigabit networks are so fast these days that even some of the fastest SSDs can't really keep up on sending data fast enough. That's that's a very interesting thing. And Hazelcast itself has um, a test lab. We, we, we have our own test lab, uh, 10 machines, uh, 786 gigabytes of RAM, 24 cores each, I think, something like that. Um, and we have a gigabit network card, we have a 10 gigabit, and we have 40 gigabit. And I, I promise, whenever you think that network is slow, go for solar flare 40 gigabit network cards. Those things are so amazingly fast. We got round trip times in microseconds. That is absolutely amazing. So network is not the problem these days anymore. And the other thing, so net network is because we have a cluster, right? Main memory is because we have an in-memory data store. I'm not sure if you can read that. Um, and I think my mouse curve, that doesn't work. Um, so uh, th this this chart actually shows um, the 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 way that the price and the size of memory moved between 1980. I think everybody knows both good uh, C64 times, and the claim 640 kilobytes might be enough for everybody. Even though I think it's not true that that Bill Gage, Gates actually said that, um, but it it's it was amazingly ex uh, expensive to go over this this 640 kilobytes. So a megabyte of RAM in in 1980 was over six grand, over six grand. Whereas today it's less than half a cent. That's actually pretty impressive, or it's about half a cent. Uh, it kind of um, stabilized at that level where it is in 2013, um, but the the memory size is growing. So that these are home computers, and I think 16 gigabytes these days is not uncommon. My home computer has 32. I'm um, I'm a gamer, so um, I'll probably need some some more. But looking at at server hardware, um, Amazon just yesterday launched I think a three terabyte J VM. 3 terabyte VM, that means they are not running a single VM on a single system. They probably run 10 or 20 or maybe 100. That means they must have machines with 30 and 300 terabytes of RAM. I don't know how they do that, but that's cool. But even as, as a smaller company, um, as I said, we have 10 machines, 786 gig each. Um, that's close to a terabyte of RAM. And I think on the HP website at the moment you can buy two terabytes right from the store without any kind of specialization. That's absolutely amazing. So I, I already said that one of or two of the main use cases for Hazelcast uh, are caching and primary storage. Caching is interesting because that is where most of our customers start from. They need a distributed cache, um, both replication caches or EH cache doesn't work for them anymore because they have too much data. Um, and then they look for distributed caches. And Hazelcast can do that for you and it does it very well. So that is where most people come in. They, they need a caching solution and then they figure out, well, I can do way more with Hazelcast. It's not only a cache, what a lot of people think in the first place. But then they start to use it as a primary storage. As I said, your application is only working against Hazelcast and doesn't know about anything like a database or anything in between or under behind that. So that is the second use case. And then they figure out there is even more. So Hazelcast also offers things like lists and sets and queues. 
and also cool things for distributed computing like a distributed executor service. And the interesting thing about Hazelcast, what we always try to do, we try to make it as simple for Java developers as possible. And that actually means Hazelcast implements those features, list, set, queue, executor service, based on top of the, the Java standard libraries. So we implement the Java collection API and the Java um, concurrency API, so including semaphores and locks and all that stuff, right distributed for you, transparently distributed. Your application pretty much doesn't know about it because you're working against the official APIs. And that's the cool part. Hazelcast tries to be as simple as possible. And even though we have a thing, well, I think it will be the next slide. So Hazelcast is itself is all about scaling out. So that means instead of always buying a bigger machine, there is always a company that can buy, uh, sell you a, a machine that is twice as fast but triple as costly. Um, Hazelcast goes the other way, same way as a lot of other NoSQL solutions out there. And that means you take cheap hardware or virtual machines or whatever, um, and you take a lot of them. And that actually gives you a speed um, improvement over just scaling out your single machine. So how does that play together? So Hazelcast, as I said, we have a Hazelcast cluster. For Hazelcast, that actually is a peer-to-peer -peer network. So I found this picture, which seems to have every node connected. I like that. And you have your cluster running, you have your application in there, but then you have this problem, right? You either want to update Hazelcast or you want to up, uh, update your own application. All people know that what we have to do is we want to roll it out somewhere. And rolling it out actually means we first have to package everything up. So that means our application code, Hazelcast, libraries, more libraries, even more libraries. And when we haven't stopped all the libraries yet, we have even more libraries. And that is still OK. So now we have like a huge jar, a war file, an ear file, whatever is out there. And we want to deploy this. So how did the, this work before we had all those cool things? Well, somebody actually had to move your your uh, war or your, your deployment unit to the servers. And that often was a manual step. Not saying that this is true for all companies still, but believe me, you would be surprised. There are still a lot of companies doing this, at least in a semi-automatic way. Pretty scary, though. So we, we try to, to deploy it. And when you actually manage to deploy, you can see yourself as a deployment hero. And that actually was true after every deployment. And I'm speaking as well from my own experience and from my own past. We did this at a couple of com companies. Every deployment, there was a special stand-up in the morning just to see that everything is good. We had to be early in the company just to do a deployment or just to know that the if the deployment goes wrong, that somebody is there. Not what we want. So what often have happened is, some deployment failed. That was that was why people was there in the morning, and we actually had to either roll back or quite fast fix it and try another re uh, rollback, uh, another deployment, and hope that this one works. And I think everybody knows how those fast I need to fix it right now things work or even not work. So Hazelcast um, started from a customer's um request to say okay let's do it differently this customer wanted to deploy on docker or as a docker image so he asked us and we said well you know that's actually a quite good idea you're probably right about that so with 3.6 Hazelcast started to have official docker images and those are all on docker hub you can just download them and what we added now uh or what we're adding for 3.7 is automatic deployment or out-of-the-box deployment for OpenShift. Um, this talk will actually show a slightly more manual version um, because it's not yet completely done, but it will be whenever Hazelcast 3.7 is out. So um, 
Diane and I, we just talked about it and we're trying to get this out as fast as possible, probably by updating blog posts and whatever. So that is where Hazelcast and Docker kind of, uh, Hazelcast, Docker and OpenShift uh, comes together. And why, why do we choose OpenShift? Um, it's, it's pretty simple. The main reason is OpenShift is easy for DevOps and for infrastructure teams to manage. And it's actually quite easy if you have a template, we see that in a bit, to run Hazelcast, to scale a Hazelcast right on top of OpenShift. And that is absolutely impressive and amazing. And I think it's a good work. So let's have some fun with OpenShift. And I actually was clever enough to, to prepare all the slides for the case that my life, life demo doesn't work, but we're trying it live, live first. So let's see. Um, so that is the Hazelcast OpenShift uh, project for now. That's on my, uh, let me see. That's on my GitHub account for now. As I said, this is still a draft version. That's not completely done yet, but we're working on that. We're getting it ready whenever it is needed. So um, I already cloned that repository and you see uh, while I was trying to get all this stuff running on OpenShift, uh, I basically collected all my commands I ever found. And it's actually quite interesting because a lot of those commands you can only find um, using Stack Overflow and you wonder yourself where people get this idea from. Um, so we have this repository right here. As I said, it's just cloned. If you look here, it's set status, perfect. Okay, so let's look through some of the, the files. So I chose the most simplistic way, I think, that is actually possible. I use a Maven pump file to build my Docker image. And in this case, I give my Docker image a name. I call it Noctarius. That's my common nickname. You've probably, probably already seen that on the Twitter handle. Um, I not use the Hazelcast image yet. As I said, this is still uh, a draft. Um, I'm a, uh, well, I have a maintainer handle here. Um, and this is quite Im important. So Excuse the, me, the, yeah. You're not actually sharing your screen right now. I'm not? No. Okay. Let me see. Uh, whoa, it stopped it. Okay. Good to, thanks for saying that. <laughs> Thank you for speaking up there. I was in, I could see it for a second and then it went gone. Okay. So now you see it again, right? Yes, it's there. Okay. So let's let's start again. As I said, it's a do, uh, it's just a Maven POM file, and uh, I use one of the smallest J Java eight images I could find. And as I said, this is pretty important. The standard port for for uh, Hazelcast is five seven zero one. That's a TCP port, and we just tell Docker, hey, we want to use that one. And here's another thing um, that is just the way I did it. Um, I give it a Java command to actually load all the libraries and, and to start my small test application. And this test application does nothing else than just, just creating a Hazelcast client or a Hazelcast member node, depending on my environment variable Hazelcast type. So we will see how that comes together. Uh, it basically installs all that stuff to opt Hazelcast, nothing important here, I think. Um, so let's build this first. And I actually have to wonder why, why it happened, but we'll figure it out. Uh, come on, clear. So um, what we actually do is we build it first. That is when the Docker um, plugin actually builds the Docker file itself and it doesn't work for, oh, right, it can't work uh, because I have to use the Docker terminal. True, I remember. So you see, I use all that Vagrant stuff, which is quite nice. It makes development pretty simple and pretty easy. Just needs to start up. For whatever reason, sharing stopped, I don't know. 
That's interesting. <laughs> there you go. Okay, now let's go there again. Still there, right? <laughs> you still got it there. Okay. okay. Uh, live demos are fun. Um, yeah, live demos are the best. And let's try it again. And I'm pretty sure it works this time. And it seems like, well, build success. I knew it works. So there we go. That means we build a new image. We have a tag for latest. And the next step is actually to tell Maven uh, or the, the, the Docker plugin in Maven to upload it, uh, Docker push. And that will be interesting because I have no idea if that is going to work. It yes. probably does not. OK, it does not. Um, but I think there is already uh, a latest version on on the Docker Hub, so we yep. just keep going, and I think it still works. <laughs> so um, let's see, what else? Uh, I think there yeah, the was one more. Is, is you're tethered to your phone, so I'm waiting to see when your your phone stuff runs out. Well, it, it looks good so far. So um, I think we're we're on the safe side on that page. Um, so what I actually missed there is a Hazycast XML, and that is um where you configure how hazelcast will do ip discovery or in this case member discovery so what we well, what i did for for openshift and kubernetes itself there is a hazelcast kubernetes discovery strategy that means it will ask the kubernetes um, dns service or rest service for other members based on, in this case, a service name, Hazelcast OpenShift, and in the inside the namespace default. And I think that might, might be wrong, but we'll figure it out. Um, I think the namespace is actually wrong, but we'll see. Uh, so let's keep going here. Um, I downloaded the Vagrant file for OpenShift, and I know it's, whoops, not the right one, for, especially. Um, 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 I think it's OpenShift webinar. I think that is the right one. Yeah, I I, I know it's not the latest version. Probably this Bootstrap one uh, one oh six, but mm -hmm. we're going to Im install this anyways because I know that one works. Um, so a uh, uh, vagrant box at name. Uh, wow, uh, OpenShift uh, vagrant um, um, OpenShift Bootstrap thing. So that will be qu quite quick. This, I think, does just install this OpenShift Bootstrap thingy into the doc local Docker repository. That's at least what I understand from what it does. But the next step will actually be pretty slow. And that is where so we can do something else like looking up a question, for example. So come on. Give me that, or we, you can already search for a question. I'm just going to to write the second line whenever that one is finished. Okay. And we can do multitasking, so that works. Yeah, so, um, I'm curious if any of the other folks that are on the call right now, if they have a question, they could um, unmute themselves and ask. Um, I know Rich Carpenter is on there because we heard him not having there and. Uh, and I'm wondering if at, at their organization if they're using any in in memory computing already. If not, if not Hazelcast. We're not using Hazelcast right now. Um, yeah. You know, I, I know there are different applications that have looked at some uh, different kinds of caching, like EH cache. Um, but I. Okay, I think I don't know works. if we've had you know anything widely spread. Mm -hmm. yeah. Curious to to find other people who are using in memory already on OpenShift and to get them get their feedback on on this approach. So so that one is definitely pretty slow. <laughs> one of the things I was wondering about is you mentioned uh, that in some cases it's being used as a primary data store and they have a database behind it. 
Does yeah. Hazelcast itself take care of persisting updates into the database, or do you need to develop something on your own to do the, the persistence part of it, or how does that work? So um, Hazelcast by itself has some interfaces. We call them Map Store and Map Loader. I'm not sure if you know the Jcash specification. Uh, they have Cache Writer, Cache Loader, which is the same idea. It gives you a very simple CRUD interface plus some um, some batching methods. And what it does, it you just implement or what what you do, you implement that uh, based on uh, writing to Couchbase, writing to Hadoop, writing to your relational database, Oracle thing, whatever it is. Um, and pretty much the same way you plug in those discovery strategies, you can just configure um, for a specific map or a specific Jcash cache instance um, that you want those interfaces or these interface implementations have to be used. So yes, you have to write it on your own, um, but whenever you plug it into Hazelcast or whenever you tell Hazelcast to use that, everything else is completely transparent. That means in the best case, there is one or two people in the company that actually know about there's some magic going on in, in the in the back end. You don't want to have one person. You probably want to have two or three. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I noticed that the uh, the discovery method you were showing in there, that Hazelcast Kubernetes discovery strategy, yep. if we have uh, OpenShift installations in two different data centers, and they're completely different installs, but a single application might be deploying into each of those environments, um, sort of for DR purposes, so if one of the data centers is destroyed, their app is still running in the other data center, being that they're completely independent uh, OpenShift environments, it would seem like that Kubernetes discovery strategy probably isn't going to work because it's being it's using uh, yeah I think some so. Of the labeling so um, not known within an environment. I, I think yeah. the important question is on how do you uh, configure your Kubernetes discovery to work, or not, uh, not the Hazelcast discovery, how do you uh, do the, the service discovery part on Kubernetes? If you have one, um, one master thing for, for that, it will work. Uh, if you have completely independent data centers, it won't work. Um, in this case, you should probably anyways use Hazelcast van replication to connect those to independent clusters. So Hazelcast has a way of connecting the two? Yeah. We have one replication in the enterprise version uh, where you um, configure the different endpoints. And the important thing is, as uh, for, for the reason that Hazelcast does data distribution or data partitioning, you don't want to have a low latency connect between different data centers. So um, that would mean that um, statistically, half of your data is in the other data center, and your whole cluster will will um, will get the penalty of this low latency connect. Uh, but what bound replication does, it adds an asynchronous um, replication channel uh, that can run in active passive or active active. Obviously, for active active, you might have conflicts you need to resolve. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And anything else so far? Otherwise, we're just let's go back to the demo and and, and get that. Okay. Completed. So I'm I'm now in the um in the uh, OpenShift Vagrant based uh, JVM uh, JVM uh, virtual machine. Uh, so I used Vagrant SSH to connect to this to this internal Docker image, and I do a sudo sue. So I get some root rights uh, because I now doing some things on, on OpenShift, you probably all know, and probably better than me. So I lock in, uh, I lock myself in into uh, the, uh, the OpenShift configuration, and I'm probably not doing it the right way. Uh, that's the only way I figured out actually works for me. <laughs> so if you know better, just interrupt me. And I'm creating a new project. I'm, I'm really happy to figure out there is another way to create a new project, but I don't think so. So I'm creating a new project called Hazelcast Cluster, and I'm actually joining that one or switching to that one, uh, Hazelcast Cluster. And we're now working on the Hazelcast Cluster project. And now comes the longest 
part and I think I just gonna copy that from my slides because I'm lazy uh, where where you are where you are there you go ah perfect so what I just did I downloaded the openshift hazelcast uh, deployment template uh, well I'm not a VI guy you figure that out so um, the the uh, OpenShift or the Hazelcast template configures or defines how Hazelcast works in in OpenShift. What is deployed? What um, what image as most specifically? And I think the image is somewhere. Uh, where is it? It down here. So there is the Hazelcast OpenShift latest image, and I hope that it will work the other way around. Downloading it in a bit. Um, it also configures or defines a couple of environment variables. Uh, we see there's the service DNS and service name and namespace and a couple of things we already configured. Uh, per default, it will always use IPv4 to connect internally. Uh, and I'm honest here, I never tried IPv6 uh, v V6 so far, uh, but I think it will work, at least from Hazelcast. And again, the configuration for the port, we know that there is only just one Hazelcast version or instance running in each container, so that works. Um, apart from that, we are configuring a replication controller. So the thing that actually makes sure that there is so much replicas or so much instances of this Hazelcast pod running that we just deploy. Per default, we always configure or we always deploy three instances. You can up and down scale this at runtime. Um, image, uh, I think that's basically it. And there is some more configuration, especially to make names nice. So let's see. Um, uh, so we already we downloaded. Now we need to uh, import it. Um, Hazelcast deployment, um, 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 and we want to install this or import it into the Hazelcast cluster project. There you go. So I think that's it so far, and. What I actually like about the Vagrant environment that it configures uh, proxy config, um, proxy setups for ports. So that is nice. So again, it's admin admin. Uh, we're just logging into the OpenShift console. And as I said, it's probably not the latest version. I think so, at least. Uh, we select our Hazelcast project. And what we do is we just say we want to add something. We select our. Uh, template, template, ego. And here are the, um, the environment variables again, we just saw in the, the configuration file. And that is one part of the game why you need those JSON, or I think you can also make YAML files, because that actually says where, uh, what, what are the uh, parameters we want to do when we, um, when we deploy this application. Um, we say Hazelcast cluster, uh, cluster local, and we want to have members, members, hard word, and we start the deployment. If everything goes right, we get three pods that actually hopefully connect together. As I said, I, I'm not 100% sure because of the of the namespace, but I think it still works. Uh, we'll figure it out. So it pulls down the image over my tethering over a Europe-based data plan. So that will be interesting. Well, we'll see if it works. And if you run out of tethering your six gig limit, well, uh, I, I think I won't run out of that. So that is that is good so far. <laughs> we haven't yet made a single gigabyte, so I think that actually works. But oh wow, it's it actually downloaded. It. Wow. Yeah, there you so go. Let's see? see. They're running. Um, and now let's figure out the. Uh, VI um, var, wow, var lock container, I think, container. Hazelcast. Uh, you might have a typo eh. there. Hmm? Uh, I, I, Hazelcast, there you go. And I think it's pod lock. Nope. What is it? Uh, yeah. 
Nope, that's the wrong one. Yeah, I'm not sure which Love one. those amazingly long file names. You never have an idea what you actually do. There you go. There is some, whoops. Uh, um, there is socket acceptor. It says stream established connection. So they're probably still working, working on it. Yeah. Well, you see that the image is also a bit older. It's 3.6 early access to. Uh, there's 3.6, um, 3.6 something out. Uh, there we go. So here's actually, we have now a cluster of three members and there is uh, 1705, 1706 and 1707. If we look back here, we see it's five, six, seven. So it actually kind of worked. That's unfortunately not very readable in the log file. Um, so we actually got a Heisekast cluster running just pretty much out of the box in Open OpenShift. And I think that's interesting and it's it's really nice. Uh, I unfortunately don't know the the command uh, out of my head right now to start another one to to scale up. Um, and I think it's not in this build of the UI yet, unfortunately. No, if you go to <laughs> if you go to um, deployments, if you go back one screen. Okay. But let's put that in the that browse deployments. Nope, not deployments or builds. No, it's build no. is is local build. I, I think the problem is um, the UI changed pretty much right after that version of uh, the the image. Okay. <laughs> All right. Suffice to say that if you did this live on um, OpenShift Dedicated or OpenShift um, Enterprise yeah. or even OpenShift so, Origin, it would all pretty yeah, much. Yeah, happen. right. It, it will it also be the UI will look li slightly different as far yeah. as I know right now. So I unfortunately don't remember how I made this nice version of the log file, but <laughs> we saw it actually works. So let's go to the last couple of slides and I think that was pretty much it. Um, I think it was easy enough, at least. Um, it's not as easy as using Hazelcast standalone. Um, but what what I really like here is it makes deployment easy. And that is, so for developers, they often don't think about the deployment part. Um, that is where you, we, we figure out that DevOps really makes sense. So you have to, in the past, we had developers and we had um, infrastructure team or operations team, whatever you call it. And operations doesn't want it to, to think about any kind of exception. So you get a Java stack trace and they just restart it. Um, and engineering doesn't want it to think about deployment. That worked fine for some time until somebody figured out, well, maybe something like a DevOp is the cooler thing to do. So. Um, I think that this this combination of Hazelcast and OpenShift is exactly what uh, what is made for DevOps. Uh, DevOps. It's easy to deploy or easy to deploy, and Hazelcast is also easy to understand for people that are not working every day with it. So we haven't seen any Hazelcast source code yet, but you can really believe me. It looks like pure Java code. So for me, I think that is what what we have to be happy about. I think we're we're in a good uh, in a good situation in a good time these days. And um, at at Jax here in Germany, uh, here in Germany, I'm in Spain right now. But <laughs> at Jax in Germany, um, uh, one guy from from GitHub gave a keynote, and he said. Um, we're going forward to a complete new millennium of deployment. And his daughter is writing her own Minecraft plugins at, uh, plugins at the moment. She's running her own server. And he said when she's going to be a full-time engineer or full-time um, DevOps at, in the end, at some point, she doesn't expect to have those long, hard, um, rule-based things for deployments. She's she will expect it to just click and run, pretty much what OpenShift gives us and what is amazing for Hazelcast. One more thing, sorry? Go, go right ahead. Okay, uh, one more thing about Hazelcast, um, the main version, all of the cool features um, are Apache licensed. You can go to GitHub uh, and just download it, send pull requests, 
bugs and issues, or hopefully you can't fi file issues, you probably file feature requests. Um, and uh, there's also an enterprise version, uh, but I'm working on the community side, so I don't care about that one, uh, besides the fact that it pays for my salary, but um, we're not talking about that. So that's the reason why I normally consider hazelcast.org to be the first place for developers. As, as a developer, you want to get started easy. Uh, just look for the examples. It's really that easy as it, as it seems on the first glance. And if you want to pay us some money and work for my salary, hazelcast.com, it's, it's already in the sites down there. And I think everybody should be able to just go for the whole presentation today and just do it out of almost out of a box at least. Yeah. So do we have any more questions? We probably have. <laughs> Perhaps um, we're almost to the end of the hour. One of the things that yep. I would say is um, if you can send me your slide deck or put it up someplace. I absolutely do that. Because the rest of us are just as lazy about cutting and pasting um, in command line. <laughs> I think that would be a wonderful thing to share that with, along with the video that we'll put up. Um, there'll be a blog post on OpenShift, uh, blog.openshift.com with the video links and the podcast um, slide deck. Um, Rich or anyone else, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I think we've we've really covered quite a lot of territory here this morning, and I'm really grateful for you taking the time to do this, uh, Chris, because I actually learned quite a bit, and I'm looking forward to updating the old blog post about Hazelcast, which I think was in 2013 or 14, with some new information and getting people started on this. So I know you're on the road the next week or so, but um, when you get back to your home office, wherever that may be, um, let's sync up <laughs> and um, get get a follow-on blog post with, with all of this, because it's really um, some great stuff. And um, I'm looking forward to testing it out myself and getting the containers all up and available on um, uh, wherever the OpenShift registry hub ends up being in the short term. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Take care. Thank everybody. you for having me. I think that is that is the most important thing. All right. Well, you keep All doing right. that, that happy dance. <laughs> <laughs>